Welcome everyone to the last lecture. Um, today we're going to talk about recurrent neural networks or present recurrent neural networks and how you can use them and then some other theoretical input. So it's more about theory today, not so much practice. Uh, before I start, any open questions left or remarks? Okay, no, no questions. That's great. Um, when you start to use deep learning or when you start to dig into the field, uh, always start with like the most simple approach. Um, these complex approaches um, you read in papers and which you saw last week, this re week, always sounds really cool. And or at least for me, they sound really cool and something, okay, I really want to use this super complex, awesome classifier. But when you just adapt them, they will often fail to learn the task and you have no idea why they will not produce any reasonable output. And there's no easy way to debug uh, complex deep neural networks. So often, especially when you start, you you run them and you don't get any output or always the same output and you have no idea why, and you're really confused. So also don't build up on existing implementations. So when you read a paper from Zocher, for example, or Kalkbrenner, and you find an existing implementation, just don't say, okay, yeah, I, I really want to use this existing implementation with this super complex and just adapt it because there's no just adapting it. So you should really understand them. Emily. So uh, what you're suggesting here, is this an instance of, of p-hacking or what's going on here? P-hacking? P-hacking. What, what's um, that? That's where if you're looking for 0.05 significance, you run 20 experiments and one of them be significant. Is that... I mean, is that what's going on? Is that what you're suggesting may accidentally happened, or um, are you saying there's some other, is there some other reason why someone else's approach, the, the, a particular approach they wrote about, sounds cool, but when it gets re-implemented, it doesn't work at all? No. So, um, I'm more talking about when you want to adapt it to a different task. So, for example, you you find an implementation from the Stanford group on sentiment classification, and you want to adapt it to a different task. Uh, I don't know. Let's say semantic role labeling. And you think, okay, I'm just going to take the code, adapt it to semantic role labeling, run it, get my results, but it's not working. So, Or usually, to my experience, it's not working because these networks are often too complex and there's too many hidden information in it that you're not getting it trained well and that it's not getting produced any useful output. Of course, for sentiment classification, you can use the existing implementation if they are like good enough. But adapting it to a different field is like really complex. And what I'm proposing is like start always like the, with the most simpler approach, because also the difference from my perspective are not so huge. So for example, when you go for sentiment classification and you do a really simple average of word embeddings, which is implemented in a few lines of Python, uh, you get 73% accuracy. When you use a recursive network, you get 79 when you use a recursive neural tensor network, you get 80. Of course, 80 is much, or 80 is better than 79. Mm. But like understanding, for example, what's like the recursive neural tensor network, how to choose the tensor, etc., it's quite complicated. And when you're not even understood recursive, or when you're not understood the average of word embeddings, you should not try like to do like the most complex things. Let's start with the easy things. So, for example, uh, as you know, there's like a current um, task force on semantic text similarity using deep learning. And if I would implement a system for that, I would like start really simple. So have my pre-trained word embeddings, just do a look up and do in the beginning the average of all word embeddings or the weighted average weighted with TF-IDF compute the cosine similarity and get a score between minus one and one for how similar are the two sentences. More complex implementation would use doc2vec, uh, but which is also already implemented and can be used quite easily. And then first focus on this, try to improve it, see how does it work. So how does it change when I change the embeddings? How does it change when I change my TF-IDF scoring? After that, I would go the next iteration and go from a cosine similarity using some dense hidden layer and a single sigmoid. So where I get a single value between zero and one and then also try to train them, see does it change from cosine similarity to 
to when I train up this layer. And as when I'm really familiar with this construction, then I would only go like to the next complex layer and maybe change these components instead of average weighting of the vectors. Uh, you could try like a convolutional layer with max pooling, a recursive neural network or some LSTM and see how does it change there. But do not try to start with like a multi-stacked uh, recursive LSTM with local tensor application because uh, it will train really long and he often it will fail and you will have no idea why does it fail. So start with the simple and use also the simple one and often you get uh, still really good results with them. Okay, just as a side note, um, today we, we I present you a complex model, which is really cool, but you should not necessarily start with it, but like for a more feature, a future application of it. And there are some really nice um, documentation, some uh, some articles about recursive neural networks. Uh, I think most of you are already familiar with it. So we start with like uh, small small site information on language model. Um, so a language model is something where you compute the probability of a sentence. So how likely does this sentence appear in a normal text? And it can be useful in machine translation. So for example, the probability of the cat is small is higher than small the cat is, as long as you're not Yoda. And also for word choice, walking home after school is more likely to appear in a normal English text than walking house after school. And it can be useful in machine translation. For example, you produce these two translations and then you will select, um, see, okay, what which one is more likely and your machine translation system selects a more likely uh, translation of it. How is it implemented in most cases? Or I think most people are familiar with like Unigram language model and Bigram language model, where you say the probability of a word at position i is conditioned on the two words I saw before, on the three words or four words, five words, and so on. And you get these probabilities by simply counting. So you, you count how many, how often do I see this bigram, trigram, and so on. And such models can also be used to generate new sentences. So for example, you, you start a sentence and then you want to finish the sentence by the machine and you can just sample it with a certain probability. And maybe some or most people have seen this crazy text where it's not really making sense, but it gets some uh, things correct. Longer engram models give a better <laughs> accuracy but require also more training data and the model size also increases extremely. Cool. And long-term relationships are impossible to capture. So for example, when I have the sentence, I grew up in France and lived there until I was 18, therefore I speak fluent French. It's more likely to appear in a normal text than I grew up in France and lived there until I was 18, therefore I speak fluent English. But to capture this distinction, and like a unigram or an engram language model is like nearly impossible. This is mainly due to, um, there are a lot of engrams. So for example, in German, we have like around 500,000 words according to Duden. So when you go to two grams, we come up with 250 billion combinations <coughs> and four grams, it's 10 to the power of 22 combinations. And you need gigantic training corpus and RAM requirements, so a state uh, state-of-the-art approach uses, for example, 140 gigabyte of RAM, and they trained their system on 126 billion tokens, which is not so nice. So the idea we now introduce is like recurrent neural network, um, which are also able to capture these long-term relationships. Um, so a recurrent neural network has, in, in contrast to other neural networks, an internal state, and this state is passed from input xt to xt plus 1. So you have some internal memory, and the network is able to, to access the memory and also to adapt the memory, to update the memory. And sometimes you find um, drawing like this, so you have your input, then here you have your network, and you have some internal state which is fed into the network, and you get some output. You can also unroll it, which makes the 
understanding a bit easier. So you have your input at position zero and you get your output at position zero. And then you have your input at position one and you get the hidden state, the internal state from the previous network. And you use it also to generate your output. And then you also produce some output, which you pass to the next uh, step. So instead of one input, you have always two inputs, like the input from your sentence, for example, and the input of the hidden state from the previous time step. Is it clear? So for example, um, when you build a language model with a, recur a recurrent neural network, you can say that x0, x1, x2, and so on, denote the words, or you can also go to characters, so characters are more typically in this domain, but when you say these are words, say, okay, this is my sentence, these are the different words in the sentence. And you can say, I set as an output the probability, how likely is the sentence? So when I have a long sentence, I just set at every state how likely is the sentence based on my training data. And what's nice here is that your memory requirement skates nicely, so it's it's linear with the number of word embeddings or like the number of characters you have. So you have really, when you use work on character level, you have a fixed size um, memory requirement and not in contrast to engrams where you need like a lot more uh, memory when you store not only trigrams but also four grams and five grams. And so this is a nice, really nice model. To implement this, or no, when you use it as a generative model, some people have maybe seen it. It was a blog post this year in May. And here, um, the recursive neural network trained on characters um, produced some LaTeX code. Uh, it was trained on an algebra book and then produced this from scratch. And which like really nice. So here you see, for example, proof omitted. So it knows, okay, proof is not always necessary, but you find like really nice structure in it. So you see lemma and then you have always the proof and then lemma again and then the proof. Uh, it just also tries to draw some diagrams. So I have never tried to draw diagrams in LaTeX because it's too complicated, but it's really cool that some are connected here, some links and you get a really good output. Um, when you read it content-wise, it does not make really sense, but I would say for most people, algebra books also does not make sense. So syntax-wise, it's really nice, but content-wise, uh, when you read it, it's like, yeah, hard to understand. Different example, it was trained on the Linux kernel uh, in C, implemented in C, and then generated um, C code, and you see it starts with like a comment, this, uh, if this error is set, we will need anything right after that BSD. We could think, yeah, it sounds strange, but we know our code could be like a real comment. And then you have like your function and uh, you see, okay, like uh, brackets which open also closes and you have a semicolon. And content wise, when you see it, uh, it does not really make sense because it uses variables, for example, which are not declared or declares a flex which is not used in the next step. But for example, it gets all parentheses correctly. It, it also um, sets here the white spaces so that you have an intention correctly and it's all generated for on character lev level. Uh, can I ask a Correct. So it was, it's just generating character, one character after the other. And it was here trained on the Linux kernel. And then it produces like this. And when you look at the output, it's really nice. It always starts with like the copyright header. This is implemented under some license. Then it includes some header files. Then it declares maybe the main function and so on. So it's a really cool output you get there. And it's a really simple model, uh, which I used there. Emily. So I, I think one of the things you're trying to say is that this, this recursive effect can learn uh, the, the pairs of parentheses. You know, that's kind of like a long, uh, long distance dependency, right? Correct. Um, but how come it cannot learn the, what are variables to print? 
Um, because it's not smart enough. But I mean, that's a long, that's a long system too, right? Yeah, yeah. So learning how many parentheses you open is much easier than learning how many words you use because single parentheses is just a single characters, but like the words are complex words. So variable names are like complete words and here it is just trained on character level. So, but I'm not an expert on generative models, but I think the output is like quite, quite cool, quite interesting. So if this is a character, uh, It's, it's, I would say it's still quite complicated um, to get also like the semantic meaning correct. So in the current approaches, it's um, still struggling to get this uh, correct that it, I don't know, declares variables and then use the same variable. Okay, so there are different topologies of recurrent neural networks uh, that can look quite differently. So you can have a one-to-one, -one, which is like a common neural network, feedforward network, uh, which you use for handwritten image, uh, handwritten digit recognition, for example. You can have a one-to-many, so you have one input and then you have different uh, internal states and then you output different outputs. So it could be you could use such a model to predict future states based on a single observation, similar to like a hidden Markov model where you have a single observation and then try to predict different future states. Can have a many to one, so you have many inputs. So for example, several tokens in your sentence, several internal states, and then one output, one final output state, which could be useful for sentiment classification where you read in the complete sentence and at the end you want to say is the sentence positive or negative. You can also have like such a model, you first read in the sentence and then output different states. For example, in machine translation, you first read in the complete sentence and after you have finished with reading in the sentence, you produce several outputs for the translated version of your sentence. Or you have something like this, so you have several inputs, and your internal stage pass from time step to time step and directly generate output, which could be like simultaneous interpretation. So you hear a word and you want to directly convert it to, to I don't know, from German to English, for example. So these are, the models are also quite flexible for the use cases and you can use it for in a really lot of different tasks. But the idea and how to implement it, it's always the same. It's just a question how to train. When do you tell your network, I want my output? When do you update it? And then you can derive different uh, topologies for your recurrent neural network. Recurrent neural network is really e easy to implement, at least when you use like a really baseline. So here's a Python code. Um, you say you define your RNN, your recurrent neural network, and then you just say for every step you, you invoke the method step. And what does the step do? So you have the hidden state H, uh, H, and to compute the next hidden state, you multiply the previous hidden state with some weight matrix plus some weight matrix times the input, and you set it as the new hidden state and to compute the output, you compute, or you have a third hidden, uh, a third weight matrix, multiply it with a new hidden state, and then you get your output. So these are like the two lines. You have your previous hidden state, you multiply it with some weight matrix, add uh, W times X, set it as your new hidden state, and for the output, you multiply this hidden state times some weight matrix. And that's pretty much everything you need for a really simple baseline vanilla uh, recurrent neural network. So these are like two lines of code, three lines of code to how to compute the forward pass. And then you can consecutively invoke rnn.step with your different inputs to model, for example, the sentence you have. Is it clear? So for example, how to do it when you use a character level language model. 
So we have, for example, the vocabulary H, E, R, and O. And your example training sequence is hello. So you have your input character H and your target character is E. And here you have some, so this is your input layer. So we, you encode it as like uh, this, as like a one hot encoding. You have some hidden layer where you compute, uh, where you multiply the weight matrix times this input layer, and then your output computes some output. And here you can see, okay, my target character is E, which is at this position. And you can see, okay, would this sentence predict the E, the maximum value here? And then you can just go to the next step, input E, um, compute the hidden layer, compute the output layer, compute the L, compute the L, and always compare it with the next character. And that's how you basically learn character level uh, language model, and which you can also, on the one side, uh, use to, to compute how probable is one sentence, and also um, which you can use to generate new, new, new text on character level. So in theory, there's no magic involved. Um, so you unroll your data in time, as you as we seen here. So we have like four four inputs. Uh, you unroll it in time. You compute the gradients. You use backpropagation to train your network. And uh, there's one implementation in Python for the character uh, recurrent neural networks with 112 lines. And not using Teano or something or anything else, or okay, Keras, uh, simply losing uh, NumPy and Python. So 112 lines of code, doing sampling or generating new text, training it, um, do backpropagation. So it's in theory quite easy. On the other side, why in theory training recurrent neural network is quite hard. Um, so. It can be that inputs from many time steps ago can modify the output. So when we had the sentence, I lived in France, or I grew up in France, and then some text, therefore I speak fluent French, we have a really long um, relationship between this. So uh, the network needs to look back like several steps in the past to see, okay, there was the word, word France, and now I have the word French and need to detect this uh, this information and what we what you have as a problem is vanishing or exploding gradient problems so when you remember for gradient descent we compute the gradient and there are two problems the first problem is that the gradient vanishing vanish. so you have a really small gradient and it's not probably going down or minimizing the error function the other problem is that you have an exploding gradient so that the gradient value gets really large. And when you do backpropagation and gradient descent, you just bounce randomly in your state and you're not converging to a local minima. <coughs> How to solve it? Um, for exploding gradient, you do typically some cutoffs. You, so you compute the gradient and when you say the gradient is larger than five, for example, you just set it to five. Uh, for vanishing gradient, it's much harder, and what people typically use is like uh, used by a gated recurrent neural network like sh uh, long short term memory. And such model LSTM became quite popular in 2015. So I do not know of many publications before 2015. So, and I would guess that you also see in next year's conferences a lot of people using LSTM. And vanishing gradients are solved by LSTM. So how does it work? Long short term memory, LSTM, as mentioned, we have like this super long relation. So we have in the beginning, maybe one or two words which are important. And then at some point really far in the future, uh, we need this information. So here we need the information that the person grew up in France to predict that he's speaking fluent French. And long short term, the long short term memory can solve this with a simple vanilla RNN. It could in theory learn this problem or could learn this long term relationships. But in practice, you, you don't see it that it's learning such long term relationship. And it's also 
that more recent input to the vanilla RNN uh, has a higher influence on the output. And depending on your task, this can be like a major uh, setback when it's when your important information is, for example, in the beginning of the se uh, sequence and not at the end of the sequence. That's how an LSTM model looks like. Yes. Question. So, what's the typical depth or length of, the, of these networks? I mean, like 10 layers or 20 layers? Or this kind of like limits you to the, to the window of states. Like it should be fixed or it's, it's not? No. So, what we you typically input here is some um, separation. So, either you work on characters, then you input single characters or you work on token level, then everyone is a token. And when you do sentence classification, um, you you just do, for example, the, or the length would be like the length of your sentence. So when you have like between 10 and 20 token um, sentences, then it would be 10 to 20 tokens. But here in a recurrent approach, you do not need to do a cutoff. So you can also process longer sentences, complete documents. Mm -hmm. why, why aren't we getting that yet? Um, Is it because we're only looking at the previous five mm -hmm. tokens? No. Um, so in theory, it could learn it. So what we have is like... Let me... Oh, that's not really better. So what we have is like, we have here some meaningful input. And then we have a lot of computations, time-wise computations, where we move like from the first time step to the next time step to the next time step to the next time step. Maybe 100 words later, we need this information at the beginning of the document. Okay, and so like X1 is France, and HT plus 1 is this uh, English-French thing. Right? Correct. Okay. And, so, and there's... So you would need, or the network would need to carry the information that here it sees France, yeah. and then it would need to carry the information for ev uh, along every time step until you arrive here and you see then, okay, I need again this information uh, that there was something mentioned about France. So if you had a training set, okay, I don't know how many words that is. Let's say that's 12 words. In yeah, yeah. Some type of connection, lots of in lots of your training samples. Would yeah. that? It would be still a problem. So it's still so what you do here is here you detect your output and you for example we just try to predict uh, English or French. And then you do like the back propagation and you back propagate it along here and then you go along this axis and then along this axis and then along this axis and along this axis. But when you go really far back in time, you have like the two problems that either your um, the gradient vanishes, so it goes to zero, or it goes to or it explodes, so it gets a really large impact. And typically, what you have then is like vanishing gradients. So it says, okay, this word in the beginning had had absolutely no impact that I'm that the network made an error up here because there were so many intermediate steps that it completely forgot uh, that this word was information, so it was not important at this position. Okay, so you, I, I, in a, a slide or two ago, you don't, don't know, but um, mm -hmm. you briefly explained how you could uh, kind of artificially uh, change that those exploding or carrying a hot yeah, yeah. cap explosion or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. But is there a... Are, are you going to tell us how to solve this problem? Is there another technique that can, or that can better pull the, mm -hmm. pull the information through without having it disappear or explode? Mm -hmm. So exploding, you typically do the clipping. Right. So but And for when is it? Huh? You're, you're going to clip everything. I mean, you're not going to... Yeah, but that's fine. That's fine. Fine. So when you say the gradient is larger than 5, 
the computed value for the gradient is larger than 5, you just set it to 5. That's in practice quite a common thing. But it's still an unsolved problem in this field how to, um, how to treat with really long-term relationships. So you probably have seen the videos from Google DeepMind uh, where they play some Atari games like Pong, Breakout, Pac-Man. And they get really good results for games where you have like an instant feedback. So I don't know, for example, for Breakout or for Pong, you hit the ball and then it bounces back and you get some points. But when you have like a really long-term um, relation, so for example in Pac-Man you eat some dots or you take the wrong turn and you walk into a dead end and a ghost is hunting you, the feedback will come really late. And it's still an unsolved problem how to, to handle like really long-term uh, dependencies. Uh, how so you're, you're not gonna, on the next slide you're not going to tell us how to solve this. I kind of tell you how to solve it, but it's not perfect, and it's it's not like something where it's not fixed. So people do still research on it and um, how to to work on long-term relationship. So the LSTM models helps the, uh, some with the long short-term problem. So there you can um, get some more long-term relationships, but it's not perfect. It's far from perfect, and when you have really long uh, relation, uh, really long-term dependencies and I don't know, maybe some complex game where, uh, for example, in chess, where it depends what you do in the beginning, can have an influence on like many time steps later. Uh, you still have a problem with that, so it's not solved. Uh, yes. Hopefully for clarifying question. So these eggs are different for different time frames. These are not the same matrices. In the so the A is like the the system automatic. And the system always updates. So you have here you 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 have your internal state H, and or you take the current st uh, internal value, multiply it by some value, some ma weight matrix. Uh, adds also um, or at the input to it, and then you update your internal state, and you do it every time. Okay, so so from Correct. So, so it changes over time for every input, and that's like the internal memory, internal stage. So, for every time, for every observation you make, the system updates internally its values. Okay. Great. Further questions? Okay. How does the LSTM model look like? Uh, there's a really nice. Um, write up about this understanding LSTM and the internal self state looks something like this and what's important to know that you have in the normal implementation a forget gate and an add gate and the model learns uh, when should it forget some information and when should it update internal storage so how does it do this I hope it's not too fast for you for the understanding so if it's too quick my presentation does just ask questions. So what you have is like a self-state C. So this is some vector, I don't know, for example, 100-dimensional vector, 500-dimensional vector, which is like your internal memory. So you have 100, 100 memory cells when you have a 100-dimensional internal state C. And here we have two gates. Here we have the forget gate, so we can delete something from the internal memory. And here we can update something from the internal memory. So the network learns, uh, depending on the training data, when is an information useless. So for example, uh, you want to do co-reference resolution, and you see that a new subject is introduced, a new person is introduced in the sentence, in the document, then you can forget the information, for example, the gender of the old person you saw before. And you have the update state where you can like program your memory, what should I store? So for example, it should store the gender of the previous person it saw in the text. How does it do this? So it's all math, all done by math. So the forget gate uh, looks like this, so you have your previous hidden states, so you have the hidden state or hidden 
of the output from the previous function and you have your current input x so your for example your current token and you multiply this by a weight matrix uh, w f for so the weight matrix for the forget matrix the forget gate and some bias value and then you compute the sigmoid function so the sigmoid function gives you a value between 0 and 1 so and you can then or you multiply it then the output uh, pointwise with the cell state so here you have two par or one parameter your weight matrix and the weight matrix learns when should it forget <coughs> something when it's become an information useless and the interpretation is when the output is zero that nothing through so it can uh, tell at certain steps this information is useless delete it completely and or at when you set it at point or when the output is one it says remember everything and for example when we see a new subject uh, forget the gender of the old subject could be something which could be learned by the forget gate So these are all uh, mathematical functions as before. So some weight matrix multiplication, then as an activation function, sigmoid, and then a pointwise multiplication with the output for the cell state here. And that's how the network can learn to forget information. Why are sigmoids here good and the others are not good? Um, sigmoid is here good because you, you get an output between 0 and 1. And so when you would scale it to a different dimension to minus one and one would not make much sense so the idea of the forget gate is how how much should i s remember the previous state should i remember everything then you the output should be one should i forget everything the output would be zero or is it yeah it's it's maybe important but not so important anymore then you would set it to 0.5 for example so when you use here a tangent function, you would get also like a negative forget that you would inverse the information, which sounds or looks a bit weird, to me at least. Then we have, so as mentioned, two gates. There's the set gate, where we first um, compute i at the position t. So also we, we have some weight matrix, second weight matrix multiplied with the previous output, h t minus one and x t. And then we compute um, the new new value c t using the tangent function here. And these two operations are always or um, so we have the two informations. IT gives the information which memory cells should be used for also which degree. And CT gives the information what should we store in it. So IT could come, for example, have the output use memory cell 10, 20, and 108. And CT is like a long vector. And when you then look at position 10, it maybe contains the gender. Uh, in position 20, it contains, is it like present, past, or past perfect the information about the tense. And you compute here the new cell value using the tangent function. How to update your internal state C is, so you do the update, so first you have the forget gate. So you multiply it pointwise, the output of your forget gate with your internal state. And then you update your state cells, so you say, here we have the output which memory cells should be used and what are the new values you have here again a pointwise multiplication so that your vector really just uses these cells and then you do a simple pointwise add and that's how you can first forget the information forget what's the old gender of the person you saw in the text and set the new new gender of the person you see right now in the text Then the final thing of such a cell is uh, to compute the output ht. So um, here you you have again some more weight matrices. So you you take 
the output from the previous step and the input you currently see. Use some sigmoid function and then you take your internal cell state, <coughs> crunch it with a tangent function, do a pointwise multiplication, and this gives you the output um, of the cell. And it's always so the cell states CT and the output from the previous step is always passed to the next um, to the next uh, yeah to the next iteration of your network. So what we see here, here we have always our cell state, and here we have then our output, and the output from the previous step is also the input for the next step. So two inputs two outputs for this cur recurrent neural network. So it's like seeing the very the labels what the label very big in the previous step like in uh, HMI. Yeah, yeah. So when the output are labels, it sees what it's predicted previous step. You can also of course stack these so uh, you can use an LSTM and input it to another LSTM and input this to another LSTM example. <coughs> so as mentioned, um, there's a really nice writing how to understand them. And it looks a bit magic, but it's like some simple mathematical uh, computations of weight matrices times vectors for your cell state or your input value or your previous state and some activation function like uh, sigmoid function, tangent function, and then some pointwise operations. So that's pretty much everything you need for such a uh, long short-term memory model. For training, um, so these are like experiences from training recurrent neural networks on characters. So um, use RS, uh, RMS prop or Adam or Adagrad. Stochastic gradient descent can work too, but has much higher sensitivity to learning rate. So use one of these uh, three implementations. It's already implemented in Keras. Clip the gradients. So um, when the gradients are computed and it's larger than five, you should clip them. I don't know, but I hope that Keras is implementing this or Tiano is implementing this. Um, initialize also forget gates with highest bias uh, to encourage remembering at start. A2 regularization, so regularization of your weights is not very common, can hurt. And there's some notes on dropout, so dropout is good along depth, but not good along time. So you should not forget between the time steps. And typically training time according to this presentation on a GPU when you have 10 million parameters is one to two days. So and that's also why I said in the beginning start with a simple model uh, because these models can get really good but often in the beginning they are really bad so you need a lot of iterations for example until it produces really good or until it starts to produce some sensible output and then it gets really good that you get an output like uh, like this or like correct latex code like this and so 10 million parameters are quite a lot so when you think of okay when you have I don't know when you work work on single words and use word embeddings with 300 dimensions there's some weight matrix I think four or five different weight matrices applied into it so the number of parameters is a lot smaller in the NLP domain which is good so training should be typically a bit faster than in other domains. What you can also do is to look at what does this cell learn so as mentioned we have the cell state our memory for example 100 dimensions so 100 you can have 100 cells and can store a real number in them and here it um, is on the example of uh, recurrent neural networks for on characters, so predicting the next character. And this cell turns on, so the blue is like a high value, red is the low value, cell value. Turns <coughs> on when 
you're inside a quote. So here you see it starts turn on and then you see here's the next quote and then it's it's off. So this cell learns to detect, okay, you're inside a quote and then you're outside of a quote again, which can be helpful to predict, for example, what's the next characters. Then we see, okay, here it's zero. Then we get the next quote and then it's active again until the end of the quote. The next cell they observed can learn uh, is sensitive to the positional line. So they train it on some books and you have like line breaks at the end of the uh, line. And in the beginning of the line, the value is really high. And then over time, the value decreases. So it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then um, when you have a line break, it's high again. And then it decreases to the end of the line. Um, which could be so cell sensitive to the position in line could be like useful to predict should the next character be a line break so it notice how long is the sentence already and then can try to predict okay now I should break a line to like go to the next line to have not a too long sentence uh, for my book for example or when you run it on uh, machine code on program code you have some line which is sensitive to the depth of the expression so here we see an if for if construction and when you go deeper into the code so when the intention is deeper uh, the de value decreases so it's sensitive to the depth of an expression and it's you always see when you go have multiple if statements for example the value decreases and then when you return back it increases again yes just to make sure so this is one entry in the c vector like a state which goes the correct that's one entry in the c vector <coughs> and you can have for the c vector for the cell state values between minus one and one correct correct so we got these i'm not sure how big are these, like, you go, like, 100 items, or see what the total number is? That's a good question. Um, I do not know what they use for this. So typically I would say it's around 100 to 300, uh, but it depends on the task. So I do not know what they used here for the characters. Um, R and N, uh, it would be a quite interesting thing. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you mean with a more simpler solution? For example, so. I mean producing that thing or producing yeah. that letter code, etc. Yeah. Through circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, does it provide us with a new understanding of gra grammatical formulas? No. It, it does not provide you with any new understanding or mm -hmm. insights into the task, mm -hmm. but it can be really useful to do, to do work. So. For generative models, it can be really interesting. For example, you learn what movies did you watch in the past, which movies did you watch on Netflix, and then it can try to predict which movies would you like to watch next, So, which could be like a use case for generative models, but you can use them also for other tasks, sentiment classification, for machine translation, and so on. But these inputs or these insights and the internal cell does not provide you any new insights into the task. But they work really good and it's, I would say kind of a simple model. So the model is always the same and you can apply it to different tasks. So you can apply it to machine learning, you can apply it to sentiment classification and so on. 
Okay, these are the nice output salts, and most portions of the salts are not easy to uh, to understand. That's how the authors say it, and that's a typical example. And they basically say they have no idea what the cell is learning in this case. So these are what I showed you before, like some really nice examples, but most cells, when you inspect them, cannot say, okay, oh yeah, great, this is learning, I don't know, the gender, or this is learning the country. Uh, but you get some random output, and it's really hard to understand that. And having like nice, easy, understandable cells is like quite rare. What you will see in literature is that there are different variants of gated networks. So there are GRU, gated recurrent uh, units, and then DEP gated RNN and clockwork RNN. And what they do is like change the way uh, these gated networks work. And the question is, does the difference matter? The answer is not really, or according to these two papers, they tested more than, I think, 5,000 different networks, how are designs of your gated networks, how you could implement these gated, and they see that the difference is not so big. So uh, what you choose, you when you choose a different model, you will not have so much benefit from it, at least um, when you use all these basic gated networks for it. So in the future, of course, there could be also more advanced network designs. So just using assistant implementations of LSTM or GRU, which are both also implemented in Keras, is quite fine. Questions on that? So, as mentioned, it's already implemented in, in, in Keras. And as mentioned, so last week we had Oh, this one. We had the IMDB data set, so we have different sentences for movie reviews, and we want to predict is it positive or negative in the sentiment for the review. And to use an LSTM model, it's really simple to do it in Keras. So you, you define, okay, you have a sequential model. Say you have the embedding layer, mapping it to 128 dimensional web. Uh, vector, then you define your LSTM, and then you have your dropout, so the dropout for the output of the LSTM, and then you have your dense vector for with a single sigmoid function to get a score between 0 and 1 for how positive is the review. And you can just train it and use it. And when you compare it to like last week where we had the convolutional with max over time, so what's just different is here that you have instead of the convolutional max over time you just define your LSTM here for example that's the only difference uh, what you can of course do is also to play around to use different combinations so there's an example of convolutional neural network combined with an LSTM so you apply the LSTM not to the input but to the output of a convolutional layer so we have our embedding we have a dropout layer, we have the convolutional layer, we have the max pooling, which is different from max pooling over time. So max pooling just works on a fixed window size, on a fixed pool length. And then we define our LSTM, which gives like a fixed output size for the variable sized input of a sentence. And then you have the activation function. And there's also published today morning in the Keras, Keras implementation, a more complex bidirectional implementation where you have one LSTM going from left to right, so starting in the beginning of the sentence, going forward, and you have one implementation which goes from right to left, so it starts at the end of the sentence, at the end of the document, and goes back in time. And then you can combine these two outputs and try to predict your output. Um, <coughs> predict your, 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 I don't know, your score, your label for the document, for the sentence. So it's quite easy to, to implement um, this, but more complex is not always better. So they train it on 
on the IMDB data set, getting here an 81% accuracy for the bidirectional LSTM model where you go from left to right and also from right to left. And when you use the convolutional max over time, we get like 86% accuracy, so 5% more accuracy with a lot less training time. So also, as mentioned, do not always say, okay, this is a super awesome complex model and will sound really great when you use like bidirectional LSTM, but go for what's reasonable and easy to use. <coughs> then there's one implementation from the Zoha group and Manning group, uh, improved semantic representation from pre-structured long short-term memory networks LSTM, which is kind of the previous tree structure re recursive approach combined with LSTM. So instead of going left to right, you can also process your sentence in a tree. So you have some syntax tree, dependency tree, for example, and you go along these links in your syntax tree and process your, your, um, your sentence like this. question is, should we do this? Should we not do this? So they compare their performance um, on the sentiment tree bank, Stanford sentiment tree bank. And what we see here is like, okay, these are recursive autoencoders. This is paragraph to vec, doc to vec. Then we see here the approach from CNN. So the Convolutional neural networks get quite good scores. Then we have here our LSTM model, the bidirectional LSTM model, where you go from left to right and right to left. Then, of course, you can also stack LSTM models. And here they present the tree structure based on different parsers. And what we see here is like a slight improvement. So, so here we have like um, 51 accuracy, and here we have like I don't know, when you use the simple approach by Kim, using convolutional neural networks, you get 48. So it's some improvement, but it's always a question, okay, how, how important is this improvement? <coughs> so my recommendation would be like, sounds maybe interesting, this paper on tree LSTM, but I would personally not try to implement it, use it, because you need like a parser or syntax tree before. So you need a good parser. It's quite complicated, longer training time. So as mentioned, uh, for this task on sentiment classification, CNN is quite really good, or quite good for that. Um, they also implemented or tested their tree LSTM performance on semantic relatedness subtask. So the six semantic relatedness subtask. I don't know, is someone familiar with it, the task? Does it, someone knows, know it? You, that you, you know it? Yeah, I mean, the six data set is a data set of image captions. At least what I read today morning about the task. So it was from SEMEVI 2014? Yes. And it's on um, entailment. So yes, but it's related to image captions. Okay. So Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Good to know. So, and what we have is like I don't know. So, we have, for the data set we have a relatedness score, and also does what, sentence one contradict sentence two? So sentence one is, for example, the, pr uh, the, the boy looks happy and the second sentence is the boy looks sad. And that's like contradiction in the, uh, what the sentence states. And what you also see it, so it's really kind of different from sentiment prediction, also the task. So here we have two sentence inputs and what's also used for. And what's quite nice from my perspective is that you can use like the same system for different approaches. So they use the same tree LSTM, get a Pearson correlation of 86% uh, without like 
feature uh, engineering, knowledge bases, and so on, and get like good score for sentiment classification and also get a good score for semantic relatedness task. Okay, now we come to the future of deep learning and we're getting close to the end. So what's like really interesting state of the art, what are people talking about? And one interesting paper also from, from supervised by Richard Socher is Ask Me Anything, Dynamic Memory Networks for Natural Language Processing. Do people know already this paper? No, no one knows. So um, looks a bit strange when you start to read it and what he says is that Basically, every MLP task can be modeled as question answering. So, for example, what are the part of speech tags in the sentence? What are the named entities in the sentence? Which pr pronouns refer to the same entities? What is the translated version of the sentence? What is the major claim in the sentence? So, basically, it's everything. It's always like question answering. We formulate our problem as a question, and we expect an answer from the machine. And that theory is they built a really good, strong question answering machine, so a system which can handle all types of question answer, uh, all type of question answering problems. And then they have some universal tool for NLP task. So, for example, what could it look like? An I is an information. Jane went to the hallway, Mary walked to the bathroom, Sandra went to the gun, Daniel went back to the gun, Sandra took the milk question where's the milk and then we want the output garden same everyone uh, everybody is happy what is the sentiment positive what are the part of speech text okay it's a noun it's a verb it's an adjective peter is called isabel what are the mentions then we get the different mentions peter's sister is called isabel is it coreferent with peter's sister is called isabel so we get coreference resolution um, then we get an input, the answer is far from obvious, and then we say, okay, what's this sentence in French? And we get some output for this in, in French. So that's the, the vision, what they want to implement, what they want to use. It's not working. Huh? It's, it's not, working. not yet working like this. But I, I will present some results on this. Huh? <laughs> yeah, not 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 as good. So this is you know the typically, I don't know. We show a picture, claim it's the output, and people get amazed by it. But I, I will get to some results how they tested it. So they propose a dynamic memory model, which I will not introduce here. But what you have is some semantic memory. So for example, they only use word vectors. But you could also use knowledge bases like WordNet, Freebase, Wikidata, whatever. And then you have your input text sequence where it uses your the word embeddings. It has some memory and then it detects, okay, there's a question and gives you the right answer. And there are some communications between them. So it's like a general model um, for question answering where it can store in memory the important information. And they tested it on the Facebook BABI dataset, which I'm not familiar with it. So it's a dataset, a synthetic dataset to test model abilities to retrieve facts and reason over them. And each task is like different, uh, different, yeah, different, well, differently constructed. So there is a yes, no question. There's a counting. So how many person appear in the sentence, for example, there's a simple negation the person is not happy, what is the person, for example. And it's still quite really simple questions for this, so you see a lot of really high accuracy, and what in the data set they say, okay, they pass an accuracy when the accuracy is higher than 95%. I could not use really this output, but what I thought is really cool, they tested it more on NLP tasks. So they did part of speech tagging on the Wall Street Journal, using the same model, achieving 79.56 uh, accuracy on this. Um, 
beating other like state of the art systems without any implementation adaption to part of speech. They used this model for sentiment. So again, on the Stanford sentiment tree bank. So you have sentences and want to have the sentiment. Also achieving their um, part of the state of the art and also used it for co-reference resolution, getting really high F1 value. So when you compare it here with like other approaches, other state of the art approaches, uh, you get quite significant impact there, or improvement there. And I think that's, or at least I think that's really nice. So you have one model, one general model, and you can use it for like part of speech versus word classification. You can use it for sentiment, which is like a sentence classification task, and you can use it for co-reference resolution where you want to have like these complex co-reference chains, which is also quite complicated task. All with the same model, of course, different training data you need to input in. Okay, questions to DM, uh, to the dynamic memory network? Questions. Okay, last two slides. Um, just at the end, a short overview. Word classification, which model can you use when you want to do word classification, like part of speech tagging, named entity recognition? What could you use? Feedforward, Feedforward networks, yeah. That's one option, different option. LSTM, correct. So we can use Senna or feedforward networks. Uh, so Senna is from Colobert and Weston, NLP ORM is from Scratch. And we can use convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks like LSTM. What about sentence classification? Which models are suitable for sentence classification? For example, sentiment uh, classification. Recursive autoencoders is one model. Which else? Uh, we don't have much options actually. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are some more options mm -hmm. than recursive autoencoders. Which else? Two more models. Yes. Recursive neural networks and convolutional neural networks. Correct. So recursive, recurrent, and convolutional neural networks. Mm -hmm. Are there three typically approaches you can apply and use? What about document classification? Which models could you use there? LSTM? LSTM? Recursive? Recursive. Ah, recursive, not really, because it's, it's not really working on such large documents. Other ideas? So for document classification, you can use the simple back of words with the deep forward network. But often when you do document classification, it's often kind of an easy task where naive base and support vector machines are also good. You can use convolutional neural networks, which are not typically not that suitable because a convolutional neural network only detects like the maximum activation in a really small window and it's not aware of like long cannot be aware of long of longer information so for example i don't know when you have in a document it can be relevant is the document longer or is the document shorter it can be relevant how often is the positive sentiment word in there compared to a negative word in a convolutional neural network is not really suitable for that. And of course you can use recurrent neural networks. And as a generative model, you can also use recurrent neural networks. So when you try to predict some future states, so uh, the person like this movies in the past, what are the movies he may like in the future? And final slide, hot future trends in machine learning. So what you see in so basically every machine, every computer you use, use three fundamental mechanisms. These are elementary operations like adding, subtracting, multiplying. 
it's a logical flow. So if y u is bigger than zero, do do a. If it's smaller than zero, do b. And it uses some external memory. So you have some array where or some memory where you can store values and where you later can implement it. So most machine learning algorithms use only elementary operations. For example, when you have naive Bayes in the training phase, you count it, and then in the prediction phase, you just count it, compute the ratio, and then do some prediction. So these are really simple elementary operations. But uh, flow control and also how to use external memory is largely neglected in machine learning. So all the simple algorithms implemented in Veka do not learn how should I use my memory. So no one learns it. It's just some simple statistics when I see, okay, what's the uh, distinction between feature for class A, uh, class A and class B. And then it does some statistics, but never, okay, store in a memory how often did you see such a pattern and then retrieve it and it learns automatically how to use it. Uh, recurrent neural network, uh, yeah, recurrent neural network can learn how to use external memory and also logical flow. And they sh it was also shown that it's Turing complete. And I would say, like, what's the hot research direction in machine learning is to use how to use external memory for machine learning. So there's a really nice paper, neural Turing machines, where they implement from Google DeepMind, where they implemented a Turing machine using neural networks and it can, as you know, a Turing machine has some memory and it can store data on the memory and you have some controller. And they implemented a system how the controller can be learned from data. So it's not fixed implemented the controller, when should it store something in the memory, but it's learned using the training data. Different direction, it's I think development of multitask models so you're not focusing on, I do sentiment classification and now I build the best system, the best network for sentiment classification, but you have more like this general purpose networks. As you've seen from the dynamic memory network from Zoha, you build a system which is good for part of speech, you build a system which is good for sentiment, and a system which is also suitable for co-reference resolution. And one interesting direction I think is also multimodal inputs and questions. For example, you see a picture and you ask, okay, what can I see on the picture? Or is the boy looking happy or sad in the picture? And that you build systems like this. So it goes more from really narrow, I focus just on my tasks on co-reference resolution for English, more to general purpose uh, systems. Okay. This is just my theory, what would be interesting in the future. So, but when you start or want to go in this direction, uh, I think these are like three uh, informations or three directions which are really interesting. Okay. Final questions, yes. Uh, about this flow of control, uh, I mean, yes, machine learning is based on statistics of data, <coughs> which also, you know, uh, uh, inside, uh, I mean, uh, beneath that, this mm -hmm. Uh, memory usage is underlying actually. I mean, the count means you know, you're using that yeah, memory. Yeah. So, what's this then? I mean, so are you taking this into account that to say that this is neglected? In what sense is mm. it So, when you do, when you use naive base, uh -huh. you implement. You say, okay, I take a storage, or you as a pro programmer sit there and say, oh, this is my storage, mm -hmm. and now I count how often does the word, I don't know, Viagra appear in my emails. And then later I just do apply statistics over this. Mm -hmm. But what it's not learned, or what's not done, learned by the machine, how should it be used? How should it use the memory? So the idea is that you say, dear algorithm, here you have one gigabyte of memory, you can use it however you like, and now use this memory efficiently how you solve the task. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that so so for example, I don't know, when you do co reference resolution, mm -hmm. you store 
or you have a feature extractor for the gender, for example, and then you compare the com gender for two mentions uh, the same. Mm -hmm. And that's what you program by hand. But the idea is that the system should detect uh, by itself that gender information is important for coreference resolution, mm -hmm. and it should also detect by itself that it needs to store this information in the memory. Other questions? Ivan? I want to technical to the LSTM again. So yes. you, you show how to use it for generating outputs. Yeah. How, how can we use it for classification, basically? Uh, mm -hmm. So do we add another, like, do we feed it into another network or softmax or it's, it's like a dynamic uh, number of outputs? So, so, so many to one. Yeah. So when you do do sentence classification, you have many to one. Uh, when you do some tagging, I don't know, part of speech tagging, you could model it as many to many. But yeah, when you when you train it in LSTM, um, the big problem you will face, how do I need to prepare my data so that I can take this data and train my model on it when you use like uh, Tiano and the Keras implementation. So how do I need to set up my, my data to get like an efficient training for it? That's still a big problem and not so easy in the beginning because you have this different possibilities how to do it. That might be a stupid question. No, there's no. Um, I'm wondering about this picture because mathematically it's always five, isn't it? So it's just that I ignore some of the uh, inputs or mm -hmm. outputs. So mathematically it's mostly five. So when you go from three to five, you can say, okay, you just ignore these two outputs. Can make a difference how you do back propagation. So for example, here you could take your first input, compute the first output, then do a back propagation, update your weights, then comp compute the second one, do a back propagation, update the previous states and then take the third input from your sequence, compute the output, do a back propagation. Here you would process R3, get the output, do back propagation and update your weights. So I need to, to code that specifically this way. Yeah. You need so in Keras there's as far as I understood the implementation or looked at the implementation, it's always this implementation. So many to one, so that you have one label at the end. And if you have like more like this many to many example, and you want to use Keras, then you need to change your or set your training data accordingly. So you would include like only the first information with this label. Then you would take like what zero, what one, and train this on this label. Then you would take all three and train on this label. So you would break this up into three different uh, sequences in your training data instead of one training sequence. But that's just how it's implemented in, in Kevas. More? Yes. Okay. Any more questions? Then thank you very much uh, and have a nice day.